Today's reading is from Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 33 through 44. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days, present food offerings to the Lord, and on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present a food offering to the Lord. It is the closing special assembly. Do no regular work. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing food offerings to the Lord, the burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings required for each day, these offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbath, and in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed, and all the free will offerings you give to the Lord. Mm-hmm. So, beginning on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day also a day of Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be the lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in temporary shelters, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses announced to the Israelites the appointed festivals of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Be seated, everybody, if you will. May God will bless the reading of his word in this place this morning. You may be wondering... You may be wondering, why are we reading from Leviticus 23 this morning about festivals? Well, hang in there. You're going to find out in just a few moments. My name is Greg Anderson. It's great to be back with you all. Uh, I am uh, here temporarily. Some of you may be thinking it's the most permanent temporary I think I've ever seen, but <laughs> trust me, we are getting there. It's always interesting when search processes, particularly as we get toward the end um, and, and holidays align, that that can be a bit of a disruptor, but your search team is working hard, and um, they have some very important interviews lined up this week. I'm staying over uh, tonight. I'll be actually meeting face-to-face with the elders tomorrow night to talk about transition, um, if it's God's will and if it's God's time. And so I would ask, uh, please be in prayer about that uh, as well. A lot of exciting things happening, and um, I'm I'm thrilled to be in this study with you on discipleship. Uh, If you were here last Sunday, uh, you know that we kicked off a study entitled Discipleship 101. And uh, last week, we kicked off that study by talking about a cause and effect dynamic. Um, If such and such is true, then uh, such and such is a result of that truth. Um, And we talked a little bit last Sunday about how we see a lot of these if-then statements in Scripture and specifically applied those last week to discipleship. So just a little bit of a refresher. If you weren't here last Sunday or if you're kind of getting caught up on where we were, this will be a nice little review. We noted um, even early in, in God's covenant relationship with his people in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, a passage, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Sometimes we noted last Sunday that uh, one or both words, the the word if or the word then, uh, one or both of those words may not be in a verse, but they're certainly implied. And so we looked at a verse like John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. By this then, the word is inferred, everyone will know that you are my disciples if 
you love one another. And then as we noted last Sunday from our sermon in Romans chapter 6, verse 8, now if we died with Christ, and again, I think the word is inferred, then we believe that we will also live with him. So the truth is there are many if-then scenarios in Scripture because there are so many if-then scenarios in life. And the range of these if-then scenarios, it's, it's profound. Um, if the kids are available for lunch, then. If the diagnosis is cancer, then. It's a pretty broad range, right? Of if-then scenarios that we face on a pretty consistent basis as we journey through life. But as we also noted last week, all if-then possibilities are recontextualized for disciples of Jesus Christ because if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then that changes everything. One of the most amazing thens that results from the resurrection of Jesus Christ is how we see other people. And not just how we see them, but how we treat them. How we respond to them. How we pray for them. And so much more. And we're going to talk a lot more about that next Sunday. Today, I want to examine another amazing then that results from Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and that is how we see him, how we see Jesus himself. And not just how we see him, but how we treat him, how we respond to him, how we pray for his truth to reign in our hearts and how we understand him. Because if we cannot grow in our understanding of Jesus, then we will always struggle as disciples. So our text today is John chapter 8. We're going to look specifically at verses 31 through 39. John chapter 8, 31 through 39. Before we get into those verses, I would like for us to set the context. Jesus is most likely teaching in this text on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So now the Leviticus 23 passage makes sense, right? So he's most likely teaching on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter 7, if we go back to verse 37, Jesus makes pretty bold claim. He says, I am the source of living water. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So he claimed to be the source of life-giving water. He claimed to be the light of the world. And then in verses 31 and 32, we read, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, when we read all of these pieces of what's happening here, it's, it's not super easy for us to understand the connection to our greater history. But when the Jews heard these statements... They knew immediately the gravity of the claim that Jesus is making. Jesus used the water and the light symbolism of the Feast of the Tabernacles to make the claim, I am the Messiah. So water and light, you may not know this, water and light were central to the Feast of the Tabernacles. This is an autumn observance 
through which the Jews remembered when their ancestors wandered in the wilderness. And as they did that, they lived in tents or booths or tabernacles. Today, it is called the Feast of Sukkot. Heard that? Heard that? Feast of the Tabernacles, Feast of Tents, Feast of Sukkot. I actually have a picture up here of a modern Jewish family celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in their backyard. See, they've set up a temporary shelter to remind themselves of the journey of their ancestors through the wilderness. Now, if we read ancient Hebrew commentaries uh, on the Feast of Tabernacles, they provide glorious descriptions of the water and light ceremonies that accompanied this feast. And they explain it like this. They say, whoever has not seen these things has never seen a wonder in his or her life. Gary Burge, a scholar of John, makes the following observation. He says, four large stands each held four golden bowls. And these 16 golden bowls reached by ladders were filled with oil when they were lit at night. So the rabbi said, all Jerusalem was illuminated. In a world that did not have public lighting after dusk, this light shining from Jerusalem's yellow limestone walls must have been spectacular. Choirs of Levites would sing during the lighting, while men of piety and good works danced in the streets, carrying torches and singing hymns. Can you see this in your mind? It's hard for me to think of a modern equivalent, maybe a a concert that we go to or some massive sporting event that we go to might give us some kind of glimpse of the energy that's in the air and and, um, the the lights and the worship. It's hard for me. It's hard for me to to picture a modern day equivalent, But, but, but back then, surely this was something spectacular. On the final day of Tabernacles, Jesus stands beneath these 16 lighted bowls, and he says, not only am I the true light for Jerusalem, but I am the light for the entire world. I am the truth of the entire world. Truth and light. That's our Jesus. And as John 8.30 tells us, Even as he spoke, many believed in him. Now that phrase is critical. Many believed in him. Because there is this super subtle shift that's about to take place in the very next verse. I want to put both verses up here side by side to see if you can spot the difference. It's very, very subtle, but do you see it when you look at verse 30 and then you look at verse 31? See the difference? Somebody want to point it out? Yeah, look at this next slide. Even as he spoke, verse 30, many believed in him. To the Jews who had believed him, do you see? It's very subtle, very subtle difference. So here's why I think John sets this up the way that he does to give insight into what's happening in Jesus' ministry and through his words. And I believe it's this. Believing Jesus is not the same thing as believing in Jesus. Does that make sense? Believing Jesus is not the same thing as believing in Jesus. If you believe Jesus then you may believe that his words are true, all right? You could believe the teachings of Jesus are truth. But if you believe in Jesus, then you know that he is the truth. Now, there's a few parallels, I think, that help us make sense of this. I'll just throw out a couple. Back in College Station, my mechanic's name is Rex, okay? 
Rex is a good friend of mine, and we take our cars to him uh, for many reasons. One, because he charges about a third of what the dealer costs. I'm sorry if any of you own a dealership. I, my apologies. But, but Rex, the, most, the more important reason I take my cars to him is because if he tells me something is wrong with my vehicle, I believe him. I believe him. He is competent. He knows cars. He can diagnose and understand what the problem is. But this is the more important reason that I take my car to him. Not only do I believe him, I believe in him. Are you following me? I trust this brother so much that not only would I take my car to him, but I would take a signed blank check and I would leave it with him. That's how much I trust him. So I believe him, but I believe in him. In your context, I have worked with your elders long enough that I believe your elders. If they tell me something, if they make a promise, if we, if we are in conversation, I believe the words that are coming out of their mouths. But I have sat with them long enough and worked with them long enough that I can stand up here today and confidently proclaim that I also believe in them. That they're men of honor. That they're men of integrity. They're not perfect. I don't think any of us in this room walk on water, right? right? But I believe in them. So, Jesus isn't just calling us to believe him, although he wants us to believe him. But more importantly than that, he wants us to believe in him. And I want you to hear me. This may not happen overnight for you, but I want to encourage you, don't, don't give up. As we come to faith, we transition through this believing his words into believing in him. And for some folks, it takes a little longer than others. God is patient. Okay? God is just. God is kind. He will use people in and around you if you will open up your heart to him to lead you to that place of believing in him. But that's what Jesus wants. So let's keep that in mind as we go into the text. John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then... You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, if then statements are not always easy to spot, but in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, the structure is obvious. If you live in my teaching, is literally in the Greek, if you abide in my word. If you live in my word, live under my word, you are my disciples. You see, it's one thing to be attracted to the teachings of Jesus, but it's something completely different to live in his teaching. Are you with me so far? An atheist was hiking in the woods, enjoying the beautiful world around him, when all of a sudden, a family of grizzly bears appeared on the trail. And the mama bear roared and began barreling toward him. And God, help me, he cried. And time literally stopped. The bear was in sort of a suspended animation. All of nature was still. And then a voice from heaven said, All these years you have denied my existence, going so far as to tell others that I am not real. But now... When all hope seems lost, you cry out for help. Are you saying that faced with your own mortality, you are ready to become a Christian? I see your point, the atheist said. That does seem pretty hypocritical. Might it be too much to ask, instead of making me a Christian, that you make the bare one instead? <laughs> God said, so be it. Time resumed, and the bear kept charging. However, when it was just a few feet away, it stopped, sat down, gathered its cubs, and it bowed its head and said, Lord, we thank you for this meal we are about to receive. Okay. All right. It's not the funniest joke in the world. But hopefully you get the point. Anybody can call on God. 
but it doesn't make you a disciple, right? Discipleship is not about convenience. Discipleship is about character formation. As the character of Christ is formed in me through abiding in His Word. It's a commitment to follow Jesus Christ and to obey Him at all costs. I don't get to decide. The teacher gets to decide, not the disciple. The disciple follows what the teacher teaches even when I don't feel like following what the teacher teaches. Because he is God, and God gets to decide. Ken Blanchard, a noted leadership guru, and um, I believe uh, to be a devoted follower of, uh, of Jesus, puts it this way. When you are interested in doing something, you do it only when it's convenient. But when you are committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. So look at the then that follows the if for those who abide in the word of Jesus. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love what Leon Morris says about these verses. He writes, the truth of which John writes is the truth that is bound up in the person and work of Jesus. It is the truth that saves people from the darkness of sin. People do not always or even usually realize that they are in bondage, and I believe that's true. People can become so seared, their minds and their hearts can become so calloused, they don't even realize anymore that they're in bondage. They tend to rest in some fancied position of privilege, national, social, or religious. And so these Jews, proud of their religion, did not even know their need to be free. Now, the Jews do something here that a lot of people do today when they are confronted with the call of the gospel. They get defensive. Has that ever happened to you? You ever tried to speak truth to someone or speak the word to someone and they, and they get defensive? They, they hold up the hand or, no, 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 I'm not going to go there or, or worse. I want you to notice what happens here in the text. They, that would be the Jews, answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Can you, you see what happens here? Did you see the statement? We have never been slaves to anyone. Um, Egypt? Babylon? Assyria? Rome? Isn't it funny how quickly we forget? Jesus, however, doesn't dive into a history lesson. Instead, he points to a deeper truth that he wants them and and us to understand. And that is that rejection of Messiah is to die of thirst and to live in darkness, spiritually speaking. He is the water of life. He is the light of the world. To reject him is to die of thirst. To reject him is just to stumble around in perpetual darkness. Jesus replies, very truly, I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, You will be free indeed. What an amazing verse of Scripture. What an amazing teacher Jesus is and this truth that he speaks. It's a spiritual reality, sadly, that in Christ can be easily abused. Because you see, when we believe Jesus, it's easy to compartmentalize his teachings and do things our way when it suits our needs. But when we believe in Jesus, that's a game changer. 
N.T. Wright observes, Christianity is all about the belief that the living God in fulfillment of his promises and as the climax of the story of Israel has accomplished all of this, the finding, the saving, the giving of new life in Jesus. He has done it. With Jesus, God's rescue operation has been put into effect once and for all. A great door has swung open in the cosmos, which can never again be shut. It's the door to the prison where we've been kept chained up. We are offered freedom, freedom to experience God's rescue for ourselves, to go through the open door and explore the new world to which we now have access. But church, isn't Satan good at what he does? Freedom in Christ does not mean that I can do whatever I want and Jesus just smiles and pats me on the head and says, it's okay, I forgive you. That's not freedom. That's a gross misunderstanding of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Ironically, religious idolatry can have the exact same impact. In this text, Jesus is, is, is interacting with deeply religious people. And a lot of times we really knock the Pharisees. But i got to tell you, I think the Pharisees, many of them truly love God's word. And I think, I think the Pharisees were adamant about keeping God's word. Matter of fact, if you look in some aspects of the New Testament, do you know that there were actually Pharisees who warned Jesus about the plot of Herod? Do you know that? So it's easy to vilify these guys and make these guys the bad guys, but sometimes we can too become so enamored with our religion that we can't see the Messiah that our religion points to just like the Jews here. They couldn't see the Messiah that their very religion prophesied, even though he's standing right in front of them. And we do the same thing today. If not from an overzealous commitment to our traditions, then possibly um, uh, over-relying on integrating secular models into how we do church. And I fear that at either extreme, we are paying a great price as a result. Dr. Michael Zweigel tweeted several months ago, Theology 101, if you run your church like a business, don't be surprised if your members complain like customers and then go shop somewhere else. He's not mincing words. And neither does Jesus. He continues, I, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. Yet you're looking for a way to kill me. Because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in my father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard from your father. And then here it comes, <laughs> an if-then statement that is one of the most direct in all of Jesus' teachings. Abraham is our father, they answered. But boy, Jesus brings it strong here. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. So the next question is, what did what did Abraham do? Well, above all else, he was the instrument of God's redeeming covenant with Israel. One of the first key components of God's covenant with Israel. And as such, he was one of the first to open the door for the coming of the Messiah. Abraham also opened his heart to God. Your hearts are closed to God, 
Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, then open your heart to God, just like Abraham did. When we open our hearts, we also open our minds to an incredible reality. Once again, quoting N.T. Wright in his book, Simply Christian, he says, we are all invited, summoned actually, to discover through following Jesus that this new world is indeed a place of justice, spirituality, relationship, and beauty, and that we are not only to enjoy it as such, but to work at bringing it to birth on earth as in heaven. And listening to Jesus, we discover whose voice it is that has echoed around the hearts and minds of the human race all along. So today, instead of making some points, I hope I've made several, but (laughs) making points that all start with the same letter, how about that? I want to leave you with a couple of questions. First question is this, do you believe Jesus? More importantly, do you believe in Jesus? Are you living in His Word, or are you relying on your religious resume? Is your heart open to God to join Him in covenant as a disciple of Jesus? And if your answer to these questions is, if your answer is yes, then let's make sure we're listening to the right voice, the one who satisfies our thirst, the one who lights our way in a world filled with darkness, the voice who sets us free indeed. Next Sunday, we're going to explore the following definition of discipleship as we study 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Disciple of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus, is changed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus to save others. We're going to talk a little bit about next Sunday about how this engages our minds and how this engages our hearts and how this is played out as we are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. We're going to stand together this morning, and we are going to share a song together this morning. Perhaps you are thinking about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, there are lots of folks in this room who would love to meet with you regularly and pray with you and study with you and and walk beside you on that journey. So a couple of our elders will be standing here at the front. They can explain to you what Uh, baptism means, what that's about, and and how that's a very important part, a critical part of this journey into discipleship. Uh, Perhaps this morning you uh, have a prayer request that you would like to share with the body of Christ here at Mesa, and um, you can do that by also making your way down to the front and visiting with the shepherds, or you can just turn to the person beside you and and ask, hey, would would you pray with me about this particular request that I have? And we can do that now while we stand together and while we sing. Lord, make me a servant.